part of what you have to do before you even think about embarking on drawing caricatures is to get an understanding of what the hell they are. When I think of caricature, I think of what I was doing as a political cartoonist, that caricature was something, it was a tool that was used, or a weapon that was used by political cartoonists and satirists to ridicule politicians. And I used to define it as, uh, I used to say that a caricature is a drawing of a politician that makes them look as foolish as he or she actually is. If you're someone who is just getting into drawing caricatures, you can definitely benefit from listening to political cartoonists and looking at political cartoons as much as or more than you can from getting the point of view of illustrators or owner operators of concession stands at theme parks and amusement parks where they draw and sell what they call or think of as caricatures. If you look at the way I draw these, I know they're not pretty. I know that the type of drawing I do does not follow the rules of good drawing, you know, good in quotation marks, and drafting. Political cartoons are clearly a type of comic art. The drawings we political cartoonists do and the way we draw them is driven by the cartoonist saying something. When political cartoonists have an idea we want to get across, we draw a cartoon in order to deliver that idea. A caricature should deliver an idea the same way a political cartoon does, or the same way any kind of cartoon does, the same way a comic strip does. That's one of the main differences between a caricature and a portrait. A caricature is not just a portrait that has extra emphasis added to it. A caricature is much more like a cartoon or comic in that it, it delivers an idea that's kind of like the equivalent of a visual punchline. It has to have a really clear idea that it conveys to be a real caricature. And I'm not saying that everything I do when I go out and set out to do caricatures really qualifies as a caricature. I don't think that everything that I do really should be called a caricature, but there are so many visual artists nowadays who are doing um, portraits and, and, you know, that saying that a caricature is a portrait with the volume turned up. I, that was in uh, Gray's book. Others have used that or stolen that phrase. A portrait with the volume turned up is a portrait with the volume turned up. It's not a caricature. It's just a portrait with a higher degree of emphasis. If, if it is a portrait with a higher degree of emphasis, that does not make it a caricature. A caricature has to say something and should have a really pointed idea that it clearly delivers. It should express a very vivid feeling about the person not just a description of their face that's emphasized. That's not a caricature. That's not comic. That's just a portrait. It's a very different thing. Bill Sanders, my main mentor when it came to political cartooning and caricaturing, used to say things like, uh, a good editorial cartoon should be just that, an editorial first, 
and a cartoon second. And he said, a cartoon is 90% idea and 10% drawing. 90% idea and 10% drawing. So it would make sense that all cartoons, all comics, all caricatures begin with the idea, not the drawing. Another phrase Bill used now and then which I found interesting and helpful was the art gets in the way. When I would visit him in his office at the Milwaukee Journal, he sometimes showed me cartoons and caricature drawings by various cartoonists and the ones that were too busy, too complex, too detailed, too flowery, too show-off-y, you know, full of lots of cross-hatching, that kind of thing. He would say, the art gets in the way. It took me a while to fully appreciate just exactly what the wisdom of that was and just exactly what he meant by it. The art gets in the way. But it actually makes a lot of sense for comic art when you think about it that way. So let's take what Bill Sanders said and go one step further, talking about caricature as a comic art medium. If you go by the dictionary definition of caricature, you wouldn't say that a caricature is 90% idea and 10% drawing. You would say that a caricature is 100% idea and 0% drawing. And not only would the art not be allowed to get in the way, there wouldn't be any art to get in the way. That's right, 0% drawing. See, when dictionaries define caricature, they never say it is a type of drawing as the main definition. They say things like, it's a representation, or it's a characterization. They say things like, um, caricature is about capturing the essence of a personality. They don't say it's about drawing their face. They usually have that thrown in later. It's not the main definition of a caricature. They never say caricature is mainly or basically a type of picture. Some never even mention that a caricature can be a picture or a drawing or an image. So. This takes what Bill Sanders suggested one step further. So a caricature can be delivered through a drawing, but not only is it not necessarily delivered that way, it quite often is delivered in other ways entirely through other media, like literary books, like plays, like films, like TV, media that have nothing to do with ever being visual or having any kind of concrete images. Sometimes a caricature is not delivered at all. For example, when you hear the phrase, he has become a caricature of himself, or she has become a caricature of herself, or they have become a caricature of themselves. In this case, caricature is purely conceptual. There's no concrete manifestation of it at all. It's purely abstract. And that's when it's actually closest to its base meaning. So a caricature, to call a drawing of someone a caricature, is not even the right word. It should be called a caricature drawing. When a caricature is delivered through a drawing, it is not a caricature. It is a caricature drawing. These words matter. Words matter. You guys who are so prissy and particular and perfectionistic about the way you draw and everything has to be neat and perfect and tidy and clean but when you talk it's like you don't you're so sloppy with words you use the word caricature totally incorrectly you abuse the word caricature you've hijacked the word caricature a caricature is not what 99% of you are doing. A caricature is not what you are doing. You're doing a portrait. Hello, you're on the air. 
I uh, don't really want to talk to Pete Wagner, but I would like to make a verbal caricature. Right. He was a punk at the UWM Post. He was a jerk with CPS. He's a punk and a jerk now. And as far as his being an apprentice cartoonist, he's not an apprentice. He's an amateur. When it comes to caricatures, being called an amateur is quite a compliment, actually. R. Crumb, Robert Crumb, my favorite comic artist, in his book, The R. Crumb Handbook, which on the cover has him at his drawing table saying, I'm not here to be polite. <laughs> I can definitely relate to that. On the back, he has this uh, great piece that he did. Uh, take a tip from R. Crumb, drawing cartoons is fun. Anyone can be a cartoonist. It's so simple, even a child could do it. And then it shows this traditional looking, stereotypic artist type guy standing on a pedestal in the clouds below. He's like got a smock and a beret and a, <laughs> a halo over his head. And he's holding his palette and his giant paintbrush and has this snooty look on his face and it, across his body it says faker and down below it says the best, the best art, art is, is done, done by, by amateurs, amateurs. <laughs> that's a great statement when it comes to caricatures in my experience that is really true the best caricatures are done by amateurs it's so simple even a child could do it if the best caricatures are done by amateurs, the even better than best caricatures are done by kids, by children. I was teaching cartooning classes that I developed and taught through the Minnesota State Arts Board. Some of the best caricatures ever were the ones that the kids did. I would always have them draw caricatures of me and they were just great and they were all different. They all had, these are like eight-year-old kids. That it's you know it's kind of like what Picasso said about trying to learn to draw like a child again. When it comes to caricatures, that kids are the best. There was a Little Rascals episode called the uh, Board of Education, B-O-R-E-D, in which there's a new teacher at the school. And uh, at one point, the kids are, you know, skeptical. Some of them are like skeptical of her and they don't really want a new teacher. One of them grabs his little chalkboard and quick does a caricature, a nasty caricature of the teacher. Well, one of the things you learn about what makes a good caricature is the drawing doesn't look anything like her. It's totally just some goofy, monstrous looking thing. And But you know it's her and that's what matters with the caricature. And if the feeling and the idea of the caricature are really funny and they really, you know, tell the world what you think of that person, it's a good caricature. Oh, the, another uh, example of that is uh, badcaricatures.com. And that is a hilarious website where this guy, you know, offers to draw your caricature from photos. The, the, the drawings look absolutely nothing like the people he's drawing, but they are issued with an accompanying apology, <laughs> which is hilarious. That's just, I had. I sent in uh, photos of myself and Diane and asked him to draw us. They're hilarious. I just thought they were great. The spirit of caricature, if it isn't comic art, really it isn't caricature. Caricature fits neatly with other forms of comic art and any definition will use the terms interchangeably over and over and use one term to describe the other. A caricature is described as a comic or a cartoon quite often. Finally, this leads to the point that a great caricature is not based on recognition by the audience or the viewer of the caricature. If I'm talking about a caricature drawing now. 
it's not about recognition, it's about identification. So these examples where you have the little rascals and you know who it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be the teacher, but you would never look at that drawing and based on the drawing alone know who, who it was. It doesn't physically look like her at all. You would need the entire context of the whole situation to be known to whoever it is who is, you know, taking in the caricature that the kids drew. The same thing with badcaricatures.com and the same thing with a political cartoon I did which was one of the best caricatures I've ever done and was extremely well received, got a lot of good feedback when it was published in the newspaper after I did it. Jesse Ventura who had been elected governor of Minnesota, and, uh, was constantly exhibiting a ridiculous level of uh, hypersensitivity to everything that was said or written about him. He kept calling the media people jackals, you know, like uh, just like Joe McCarthy had done and Senator Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s. And uh, so I did this cartoon that showed Jesse's thin skin compared to other things that were very thin, like microscopically thin. That was an excellent caricature. It didn't have anything to do with recognition, but it was all about identification. It was very clearly identifiable uh, through other elements in the cartoon. So, uh, identification and, again, comic versus portrait. Caricature versus portraiture. Caricature, 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 portra
One time in the mid-1970s, three of the most popular editorial cartoonists in the country, Pat Oliphant, Bill Malden, and Paul Conrad, appeared on The Tomorrow Show on NBC TV with Tom Snyder. At one point, Snyder produced sketch pads and markers and asked them to draw some caricatures of politicians on camera, and Conrad kind of blanched and replied in an irritated tone, Oh, you want us to do tricks, eh? The idea of just thinking of drawing pictures as performing some kind of a stunt or feat or trick where it's like you stand on your head or jump through a hoop just isn't what comic art is all about. It isn't like juggling or sword swallowing or being shot out of a cannon. True comic art involves thinking and coming up with ideas of your own, specifically comic or funny ideas and you deliver them like a comedian. So the goal isn't to get people watching to say, oh wow, look at what he can do. Most people could never do that. That's really something. So, you know, it isn't to wow the audience with the artist's great mechanical or technical skills and superior acrobatic hand-to-eye coordination talents. It's to make the audience laugh and to make the audience think and feel through laughter. I think now I would update the stereotype R. Crumb did back in about 1970 where he showed the typical artist as a big faker on a pedestal. Nowadays I would change the stereotype to a little wannabe on a pedestal. There's been this explosion of young people who want to be artists thanks to the high self-esteem movement among parents and educators after the mid-1960s. Everybody gets a medal. <laughs> Everybody gets a trophy. It's kind of like the Napoleon Dynamite character where there's this uh, way of thinking about drawing mainly as a skill and it's, you know, it's implied that anybody can learn to do it and some some learn to do it better than others. So they think of drawing as a like a technical feat or a trick or a stunt, not as a way of communicating an idea. It's not a language. Mm -hmm. When I was first getting my cartoons published in newspapers, there was almost nobody who aspired to be an artist and no way to quote learn unquote to draw cartoons. There, there was just a tiny handful of us who got into cartooning and comics and caricaturing and it was because it was second nature for us. It was something we fell into by accident, not something we thought of as any kind of a career choice. I had no intention of becoming a cartoonist, but I had started doing political cartoons for my high school paper because I was pissed off about being busted for going through the halls one day without a hall pass, and I figured that doing a cartoon was the best way to express my outrage and get revenge on the little narc who snitched on me. My best friend in college who had also gone to the same high school kept urging me to go into the offices of the college newspaper, the UWM Post, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and offer to do cartoons for them. And I said, nah, I kept saying, nah, I don't want to do that. There's no future in it. You know, it's, uh, there's no point in it. And he kept kind of just goading me, no, oh, you should do it. You should take your, you should go in and do that. You should do cartoons. The editors were all these hippie-like 23-year-olds. They looked at some of my stuff and they said, 
Whoa, these are great. Can you do three of these a week? We'll pay you. Those were kind of the magic words. You know, I was like, oh, I can get paid for this? I didn't know. I was working my way through college as a janitor. Had no idea you could get paid, you know, for doing cartoons for a college newspaper. And they actually were paying more than what I was making, working five nights a week, four hours a night, cleaning toilets. So I quit my janitor job. And I remember my dad saying, uh, uh, I don't know, Peter, I wouldn't quit that janitor's job if I were you. <laughs> and he made fun of me when I was sitting at the kitchen table one night trying to come up with ideas for cartoons that first week or two that I was doing them. And I remember him coming in after work. He was a workaholic. He came in and he went, ha ha, Peter thinks he's going to be a cartoonist now. So I got absolutely no encouragement from my family. Next thing I knew, I was syndicated to about 300 newspapers and published in Time Magazine and the Washington Post. And before I graduated from college, Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler Magazine, called and offered me the position of political cartoonist that he said he was creating. And uh, that was right at the peak of Hustler's infamy and popularity. And uh, so I had actually about I had at least four million readers there. I think it was, it could have been up to six million. One reason I like R. Crumb is because when I was publishing Mini Ha Ha, the Twin Cities sorely needed humor magazine, which was kind of a precursor to The Onion. Uh, the Onion came along about 10 years later in Madison, which is, you know, close to Minneapolis. One of the comic artists I hired, Jay Lynch, told me he had sent a sketch pad of his work to Crumb and asked him to critique his drawings. And Crumb wrote little notes, you know, on the pages and in the margin of one page he wrote to be an artist in america is to be a real loser <laughs> I thought that was just perfect and that that's exactly what everyone thought when i was a kid growing up it was not a desirable thing to try to be an artist Art Spiegelman, the only comic artist to ever win a Pulitzer Prize for graphic novel he created, Mouse, he says in a documentary that was done about him, being a cartoonist is an insane way to try to make a living. And I noticed the emphasis on the word try. I always remember at one family get together, my uncles and aunts were congratulating my cousin on the fact that he did the right thing and returned a lost wallet he found to its owners. And, um, my cousin was probably about 10 years old at the time, and he said, yeah, well, the guy who lost the wallet, he was an artist, and he kind of rolled his eyes when he said it. He's in a tone of voice, like, you know, oh, poor guy. And he added something about, like, so he really needed what little money he has. <laughs> like, I think he described the house or the, when he went to the door, how poor they looked and how bad it looked. So... My my parents never encouraged me to try to go into any kind of art-related thing as a career. My dad kept asking me when I was going to, you know, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> uh, until finally, when I was published in Time magazine, and he could show that to all his friends and kind of brag about it, then he then he kind of shut up about it and let me. By that time, I was 20. Today, you have all these kids whose parents kept telling them just the opposite. All these deluded baby boomers who misled their poor kids into thinking they could make a living doing anything they wanted. Oh, my child is so talented. And they didn't even say, my child should be an artist. They they all had the gall to say, my child is an artist. You know, Before the kid had even done anything with whatever raw talent they might have had. A lot of the young artists who draw at theme parks remind me of these spray paint graffiti artists. I think they do these more to impress each other than they do for any kind of a real audience, which is kind of a shame because they obviously have some skill. They have some, some talent, some of them, but they just think of it as a technical feat. Normally you can't even see these at all because there's so many leaves on these trees and bushes here. Talk about hiding your light under a bushel. Wow. I mean, 
Pretty sad, really. Waste your talent back here where nobody sees any any of it except the homeless people who live over in that tent there in the back of these industrial woods. What a waste. And all they can think of doing is writing their names over and over. Legends in their own minds. In the stand-up comedy world, it's called playing to the back of the room. I think when artists or comedians do this, they do it mainly because they're afraid of the audience. They're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of not getting enough strokes. They just want to be stroked. They want short-term stroking. They don't want to actually reach anyone. They don't care about that. So they're not really artists. They're technicians. They're mechanics. They're wrists. Oh, I'm a great artist. <laughs> hey, ain't I great? Hey, look at me. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're great. You're great. I'm great too. Look at me. Aren't we great? Oh, we're great artists. These uh, Napoleon Dynamite uh, type uh, guys who want to be artists, um, the way they just hate the way I draw, I can't stand it, and they, yeah, they talk about it among themselves, like, oh, this is such, this guy, Wagner is so bad, he's so bad, he sucks. Um, it, to me, it would be like, almost like somebody getting all bent out of shape over the way you uh, write, you know, like your handwriting. Oh, I can't stand the way you dot your I's and cross your T's and that uh, uh, way you make a V like that. Oh, God, I can't stand that, you know. <laughs> it's just quite silly. I mean, if you think of it as communication, it's silly. So these guys, they would never uh, probably want to listen to any, but if you try to talk to these guys at all about uh, anything like what Paul Conrad said, for example, uh, about uh, when he said, uh, I've never seen bad art hurt a good idea, but I've never seen a really good drawing save a bad idea. Now that just completely goes over their heads because they have no ideas whatsoever. <laughs> it's just, they think the only reason you draw is to impress people with your skills. Skills. <laughs> If you don't think it matters what some of the greatest and most successful political cartoonists say about comic art and how comic art doesn't have the same objectives and doesn't follow the same kind of rules as straight art does, then how about what the king of comics, Jack Kirby, said that totally echoes those very same sentiments that the famous political cartoonists expressed? There's a terrific audio clip you can find online, or you can find transcripts of it all over the place, of Jack Kirby. When drawing comics, you aren't there to paint the Sistine Chapel, unless somebody ties you to a ceiling or something. And he concludes his talk by saying, Damn perfection! It's not the draftsmanship, it's the man! The draftsmanship? Hang it! And I always loved the comment by Stephen Hawking. Perfection is highly overrated. I could probably do a whole 90 minute movie about how all these different cartoonists keep saying the same kind of thing. And one after another, they reiterate these very same exact points. Lee Lorenz talking about one of the other cartoonists at The New Yorker. In just a few lines, 
He tells you everything you want to know. The best ones can do that. Matt Diffie. If it looks like it's labored over, something doesn't work in the comedy. Dave Cypress said a number of things that are worth quoting. Here are a couple of them. I'm completely untrained. I've never been to art school. People have looked at my drawings and called them awkward or he can't draw and stuff like that. And I love that. <laughs> he also was talking about how people call this stuff primitive and raw. Cypress also said it looks really easy, which means it's really good. When cartoons are really good, they look easy to do. George Booth, one of my favorite cartoonists of all time, when I draw, if you imagine whatever the thought is, it's better than what I could draw. In other words, he leaves it open to the imagination of the viewer by not making the drawing too clear or precise. Mort Gerberg, I love his definition. A cartoon is an instant communication of a funny idea. And I also like that he added cartoonists' minds are wired weirdly. I totally agree with that. What matters is that caricature is one of the three main kinds of comic art, not straight art. So the same things all these cartoonists are saying apply to caricature as they do to cartoons and comics.